Good morning, everyone. It's your fifth day of the summer school and the summer crash course on ecological and feminist macroeconomics. My name is Corina Dengler, and I'm um, extremely happy and excited to be here with you today and to talk about um, feminist futures and future alliances between feminist and ecological economics. So, um, I am based in Bremen, Germany, and um, I did my PhD, so I'm a feminist ecological economist, and I did my PhD in um, feminist economics, and looking at specifically how, what degrowth, like the degrowth movement can learn from um, the feminist critique of science, economics, and growth, so my PhD was pretty much already on this intersection, on this convergence between ecological economics and feminist economics. And it's really nice to be here today and um, talk about how, like you already had this whole week course of um, feminist macroeconomics, ecological macroeconomics, and to try to integrate those perspectives a bit more. And as always, when we're talking about future alliances, I think it's really important to see that we don't have to reinvent the wheel because there's already so much there actually. So in line with um, what Katia Grigorati and Ria, Ria Raphael say in this um, book towards a political economy of degrowth, they talk about degrowth, feminist degrowth, but I think it's the same for feminist ecological economics. They say that what may be needed is not to recast existing intellectual histories by steering feminists in but to critically engage with this early scholarship, appreciating its historical significance and unique contributions to contemporary debates. And I think that's what I want to do with you today. Um, I, my presentation, my lecture today has two parts and it tries to answer the questions how feminists have engaged with the environment, mainly since the 1970s and also vice versa, how, for example, ecological economists have engaged with feminist issues and what this means for a feminist ecological economics approach. And I have um, two different parts of my lecture. The first part um, briefly summarizes different um, strands of thought of feminist academic engagement with the environment since the 1970s. It's not strictly or it's not at all actually limited to economics. So you will um, see that I, um, I believe that if we're really to find solutions to this multidimensional crisis we're faced with, we really need to move beyond strict disciplinary um, discussions and we need to broaden our, our understanding of economics as also including political science and sociology and history. So I'm looking in an interdisciplinary manner on feminist academic engagement with the environment in the first part of this presentation. And then against this background in the second part, we're going to look at one specific stream um, of one specific stream um, of feminist academic engagement with the environment, which is feminist ecological economics. And we try to discuss like how can we move towards an economics that actually integrates feminist and environmental concerns. So as for the first part, um, there are different streams and um, schools of thought we're going to look at. We're going to look at the subsistence approach. We're going to look at materialist ecofeminisms, at feminist po political ecology, at various post-colonial feminisms, and at new feminist materialism, just to show how broad this whole context will be, to then on the second part move towards really feminist ecological economics. And I'm starting right away, I guess, with um, an approach that is called the subsistence approach. Um, I could have started obviously with any of those streams of thought, but I'm starting with the subsistence approach because it was actually very um, influential for my own formation and my own understanding of the various interlinks between feminism and the environment. So um, the subsistence approach is an approach that was 
formulated in the 1970s in, in Germany. It was formulated by Veronika bellenholt thompson You see her here in the middle, Claudia von Wallhoff in the bottom, and Maria Mies um, in the top. And especially the writings of Maria Mies were kind of very influential for my own formation. And what the Bielefeld or the subsistence approach does is actually it's drawing on much earlier work going um, back as far as Rosa Luxemburg in the beginning of the um, 20th century. So in the beginning of the 20th century, Rosa Luxemburg already said that you can see it here in the green box that non-capitalist organizations provide a fertile soil for capitalism. More strictly, capital feeds on the ruins of such organizations. And also this non-capitalist milieu is indispensable for accumulation. The latter proceeds at the cost of this medium nevertheless by eating it up. So what Rosa Luxemburg is telling us already as early as 1913 um, is that for economic growth and for capitalist accumulation to happen, what we need is always an outside. It's always a non-capitalist milieu um, that kind of is internalized into or is subsidizing in a way um, the growth paradigm. And what um, the subsistence approach did is was drawing on this work from Rosa Luxemburg and looking at what is this non-capitalist organization and this non-capitalist milieu that, um, that our economic paradigm is feeding up on what is it actually and say so specified that it's actually like three distinct um, spheres. On the one hand, it's the sphere of nature. On the other hand, it's the sphere of unpaid care work, which until today you've heard a lot about this since the last days probably is mostly carried out by women. And it's also the question of continued colonial relations despite formal decolonization. So it's also colonies that we're up until today, capitalism is still feeding a lot upon unequal exchange in the world system. So, so a subsistence approach in this way was a very early approach. It really radically challenged our understanding of what the economy is. And also, like on the one hand, it's a critique, and on the other hand, it goes beyond. It offers a perspective, a subsistence perspective, um, which doesn't center anymore around um, capital accumulation, but it centers around life and everything necessary to produce life on this planet. Namely, they call it subsistence production, but you will see, like, if you look into this um, terminology, it's not also different from what Marilyn Power has, like, 25 years later called social provisioning. So, really, this life serving needs in the center of the subsistence approach, which is also key to um, feminist economics. I want to go a bit deeper into um, the work of Maria Mies, like her um, book. Patriarchy and Accumulation on a World Scale, which was published in 1986. She is very explicit there on that she is um, rejecting economic growth on the grounds of its patriarchal, colonial, and ecologically um, destructive characters. She's one of the first academics who's actually really clearly making this connection between those three spheres, like patriarchy, coloniality and um, destructive society nature relations. And she writes like here, I brought a quote, um, capital accumulation or permanent growth was possible as long as huge areas of human and non-human production could be colonized. Women, nature and the people and lands of Africa, Asia and Latin America seem to have been the main colonies. What was more, these colonies were not only interconnected, but they formed the invisible underground foundation for this accumulation process. We used the metaphor of an iceberg where capital and wage labor forms a visible economy above the water. You can see the iceberg here, like you have the small triangle above the water. It's um, the tip of the iceberg counted in GDP, where wage labor is protected by a labor contract and where housework, work, 
in the informal sector, work in the colonies and nature's production forms the underwater part of the economy. So when I'm coming to feminist ecological economics a bit later in this, in this lecture, you will see that we're discussing pretty much the same thing, namely that um, kind of like this monetized economy, which is the tip of the iceberg, really feeds on and needs um, this underwater part of the economy, but at the same time destroys it or invisibilizes it, devalues it. So that was the first approach I wanted to introduce to you. Um, the second approach, which is really related, one could also say maybe that the subsistence approach is only like a variety of materialist ecofeminisms, like a German specificity or whatever. Um, but I made it a different stream. I also made post-colonial ecofeminisms a different stream just in order to show that materialist ecofeminisms emerged in a different geographical setting, namely mostly in an Anglo-American context. When we um, talk about like so founding mothers, let's say of, um, of materialist ecofeminisms, we're often talking, for example, about Rachel Carson in the 1960s in the US and um, various others. And um, in 1980s, there was a conference in Amherst called Women and Life on Earth, Ecofeminism since the 80s. And one could maybe argue that this conference was really foundational for what is today understood as materialist ecofeminism. We have eco early ecofeminists like Carolyn Merch, and I already said um, Rachel Carson, who was much earlier still, 15 years earlier still. Um, Carolyn Merchant, Val Plumwood, Greta Gard, Ariel Saleh, Mary Mellor, but also like we will talk about her later, Vandana Shiva from the Indian context and Maria Mies from the German context. Um, one thing that I always need to discuss when I talk about um, ecofeminisms, um, because I think it's probably maybe not even one of them, but maybe see most common understandings there is when we're talking about feminist engagement with the environment, is that people say, oh yeah, but um, ecofeminism, that's really essentialist, because what ecofeminists say is that, um, that women are closer to nature by giving birth, and so kind of a spiritual ecofeminism, and I actually thought the same. Um, when I was still a student and I first started, like I dived into um, feminist issues and then I started to deal with ecofeminism and I was like, yeah, feminist ecological economics, that's very important, but ecofeminism, ooh, that's a bit of a different thing because it's also in a way essentializing and um, it's um, the plain fact is that it's in most, most, most cases, I would argue like 95% of the cases, it's not 95% of the cases. Um, what happens is that ecofeminism really takes a decidedly materialist analysis where they say that women are, for example, socialized into being more caring, for example, by having already when they are children, they get dolls and say um, play mother, father, child and um, are the mother. So they are socialized into this role for a whole life. And if you do this for a whole life, then at some point you're also embodying those values. But that's totally different from saying that it's a biological fact and an essentialist fact that cannot be challenged. I also brought um, two quotes on the next slides um, from like early ecofeminist literature so it shows this pretty well, I guess, um, what I mean when I'm saying this. So Mary Miller, you see her here um, in the bottom. She's um, an ecofeminist also who kind of coins the term of an ecofeminist political economy. One could say ecofeminist political economy is a substream of ecofeminist thought. And um, what ecofeminist political economy does is actually taking a closer look at how economic systems are deeply gendered and rest on this exploitation of female codified unpaid care work and the environment, as we will also hear later in feminist ecological economics. So here are the quotes I, um, I told you that I brought. The first one is from um, 
It's this really groundbreaking book by Carolyn Merchant, um, The Death of Nature, Women, Ecology, and the Scientific Revolution. It's a book from 1980, and one could argue that it's one of the founding texts, really, of Anglo-American ecofeminist um, thought. And what she does is going back really far in history, as early as the scientific revolution in the 16th century, to show how this um, feminization of nature on the one hand and the naturalization of the feminine on the other hand really goes back to um, the scientific revolution and the thought claimed there to kind of have always those dualisms between um, human nature, reason, emotion, man, women. So all those dualisms go back to the 16th century. Is that what she retraces? And in um, the preface, what she's saying is that there are no unchanging essential characteristics of sex, gender, or nature. In seeking to understand how people conceptualize nature and the scientific revolution, I am asking not about unchanging essences, but about connections between social change and changing construction of nature. So it's really about um, where in the economic system do people stand and what's, what's their position in the gender division of labor rather than about unchanging essences. The same um, can be retraced in the work of Val Plumwood, who's um, also one of the early ecofeminists who wrote this piece, Feminisms and the Master, Mastery of Nature from 1993. And she's diving even more deeply into those dualisms. And she, she shows that it's not only the problem, it's not only the dualisms in a way that we have a dualism between culture and nature, male, female production and reproduction, especially like in, in Western thought, right? Because like we will see here afterwards that in um, post-colonial ecofeminisms, a lot of people say like, oh, but we don't have this human nature divides that you're always criticizing in an Anglo-American tradition in the same ways and you're talking about it. Um, she also argues that this assumption that women and especially rural women have a different relationship to nature is not based on, and I'm quoting again, essentialism, the appeal to a quality of empathy or mysterious power shared by all women and inherent in women's biology. So it's not that, but it's based on a different socio-historical positions that women are ascribed to in patriarchy. So that was what I wanted to tell you about the second stream of thought, materialist ecofeminism and the Anglo-American tradition. Then, as I said, there's various um, post-colonial ecofeminisms. I hope that maybe also um, in the lecture yet to come, Michelle will also tell you more about those, but I thought I'm bringing um, some as well. Um, so one of the earliest debates we had in post-colonial ecofeminist thought was actually like in the 1980s and Vandana Shiva, you see her here in the middle, like she was really foundational for us, namely for the women, environment and development approach. And what we saw in this women, environment and development approach is really a critique of the notion of saying women are more vulnerable, vulnerable to environmental destruction, full stop. That's it. So what Vandana Shiva did and this whole women environment and development approach is showing that women are actually agency endowed, that women are the first ones who um, engage in environmental activism as well. And kind of like this um, WED approach is really emphasizing um, the agency of women in environmental justice struggles taking inspiration, for example, in the Chipko movement in India or the Green Belt movement in Kenya. And um, it wasn't only inspirational for, I don't know, the Indian context, but actually if you're really looking into, into eco-feminist work from the Anglo-American tradition, like in the 1980s, everyone referred to the Chipko movement in India and um, the Green Belt movement in Kenya. But at the same time, somehow, sometimes like so, streams of thought 
remained still in a way and invisible as in say only served as examples and not the people who built the theory and that's plainly untrue and that's why i think we really also need a decolonial reading of of ecofeminisms um so bina agarwal you see her here in um in the bottom of the slide she criticized in 1992 um this woman environment and development approach in a way um, of saying that it kind of homogenizes women and overlooks a broader debate how, for example, gender, intersex with class, with race, with case. And one could say is that her, like she called it feminist environmentalism, that her feminist environmentalism was one of the first in intersectional interventions into this debate. And one could argue that today an intersectional perspective is deployed in most of ecofeminisms. So most of ecofeminisms and also feminist political ecology really acknowledge this, that we cannot only look at gender as a sole category, but we need to look also at intersecting categories of oppression, as famously lined out by um, black feminists like um, and so a Combahee River Collective in the US or Kimberly Crenshaw who coins this term intersectionality. So one could say that today so it's more mainstream than it was back in the 80s when Bina Agarwal was one of the first people who criticized ecofeminism for neglecting intersectionality. Um, today, one could argue that many post-colonial feminisms are linked to critiques of development also, to post-development approaches, to post-extractivism approaches, and they engage with very different topics that reach from um, questions of extractivism and um, also resistance against extractivism, to collective modes of reproduction, to the sustainability of life, and also to caring for the human, but also for the more than human. And as I already teased, um, teasered before, one could say that many post-colonial ecofeminisms challenged this notion of a human culture or human nature divide, which they say is really anthropocentric. Um, this understanding that humans are fundamentally distinct and different from nature and kind of in a more like one could say, for example, in the concept of Buen Vivir, it's really clear that it also includes um, care for surrounding nature and also emphasizes this non-anthropocentric notion of interdependence between humans and nature that already transcends this culture nature divide. So when Anglo-American ecofeminists were saying, oh, we need to transgress it, Post-colonial ecofeminists sometimes stressed we're already doing this. We didn't have this divide in the first place. So that's maybe some thoughts on the third stream, which I hope that you will learn about also more. Um, and I now want to move on to feminist political ecology. Feminist political ecology, you already can see that the streams I'm I'm I chose to introduce to you, they are overlapping in some times, but still they have like features, but we will see in the end when we try to summarize that there are really also reoccurring themes that um, keep coming up in all of the streams. So what is feminist political econo ecology then? Um, more generally, before we start what um, feminist political ecology is, let's um, talk about political ecology. Political ecology is really um, a stream of thought at this interface of political economy and critical geography. So it's a substream of critical geography, analyzing topics like, for example, access to resources, power relations, and kind of like trying to adapt or adopt a um, holistic perspective on ecological distribution conflicts. And feminist political ecology, it's kind of the feminist part of the stream of thought, like feminists saying like, oh, if we really want to look at um, ecological distribution conflicts, we have to see that in many ways they are highly gendered. 
So it links um, political ecology with, for example, feminist cultural ecology, with feminist geography, and with feminist political economy. And the book that you um, see here on the top, um, Feminist Political Ecology, um, Global Issues and Local Experiences, it was published in 1996 by Diane um, Rochelle, Barbara Thomas Slater, and Esther Vangari. And it was really foundational for this, um, this stream of thought, which we nowadays know as feminist political ecology. Um, the volume you see in the bottom, feminist political ecology and the economics of care in search of economic alternatives. It's a more recent one published by Christine Bauhart and Wendy Harcourt, and of drawing upon this and connecting it to also economics more, like the economics of care, like how can we actually interlink feminist political ecology and feminist ecological economics. So feminist political ecology is taking um, a power sensitive and grounded approach to studying gender dimension of, for example, resource endowment, environmental policy, or also environmental activism. And it often, I think, it's not very um, specific to feminist political ecology, but generally for political ecology and also for geography to um, work a lot with case studies like Morrison, for example, in um, materialist ecofeminist, more in feminist ecological economics. We're really looking, diving into case studies um, that usually deploy also an intersectional feminist and sometimes also a queer or a post-humanist perspective. And it is this posthumanism that also links in a way um, feminist political ecology to the last stream that I wanted to introduce in this first part of the lecture, namely to the stream of um, feminist new materialisms. Um, one could say that feminist new materialism is a very interdisciplinary endeavor that is influenced by science and technology studies and also by post-Marxism. And it really, feminist new materialism really deals more with those philosophical meta questions of materiality, of agency, of relational ontologies. So it's a bit different from the streams we've talked about so far. And it's very much in line with this material turn in feminist theory. One could say that like in the 1980s, 1990s, there was really this discursive structuralist turn in feminist theory. And now um, from the beginning of, of the 21st century, um, feminists have continuously said that now we're having a material turn in feminist theory again. And feminist new materialism highlights the role of matter, of materiality, and kind of engages with um, scholarship that refers also to bodies, to environment, and also to critical philosophy of science. Um, for example, Karen Barat, who you see here in the top of the slide, um, she um, kind of founded this ontology of an essential realism um that rejects the ontological primacy of things that can interact and instead talks about phenomena which are the ontological inseparability and the entanglement of intra-acting agency so you already see like it's a bit of a different debate um more abstract if you want and um, one person who is certainly very famous um, for feminist new materialism, but also for many other things, like she was one of the persons who um, back in the 1980s wrote very influential work on feminist philosophy of science. But like in her newest book, for example, Staying with the Trouble, Donna Haraway, you see her in the bottom here. Um, she really goes also into those debates of feminist new materialism, arguing that we should stop talking about, for example, an Anthropocene or a Capitolocene, and we should instead kind of decenter humans from our visions already now and talk, for example, she suggests of a Stuluzine, which is an entirely different multi-species story where human beings are with and of the earth and the biotic and abiotic powers of this earth are in the main story. 
Um, so you see feminist new materialism, it's um, a very, like, I find it a very interesting stream of thought. I always, always have my troubles also to kind of know, like, how do we actually fight a political or economic system that is based on um, the structural devaluation and destruction of nature. It's based on colonial continuities and patriarchy. How do we actually fight an economic system like this if we're not naming it anymore and if we're moving beyond, venturing beyond those visions already in the here and now? But so is our questions that maybe we can also um, discuss in our session on Friday 16th. So that's it for the first part, like this brief overview or maybe also comprehensive overview, it wasn't all that brief I realized, um, of um, feminism and the environment, um, feminist streams of thought since the 1970s that have engaged with the environment. And what we have seen is that all approaches really share this critical starting point of questioning power hierarchies within capitalism, while all of them focus kind of on different facets of this power structure. And we have seen that some recurring themes that um, are kind of in all of those streams, maybe not so much feminist new materialism, but for sure the others are. Um, the critique of a culturally embedded conceptual dichotomy, such as nature, culture, production, reproduction, and human, non-human, and especially problematizing that there's always a hierarchy within those, um, within those conceptual dichotomies. Another theme that keeps reoccurring is um, that all or many streams highlight the structural devaluation of that which is not monetized in our current economic system, which is of natural processes and social reproduction. And um, the third point is that all um, approaches really um, demand to broaden or in ma many cases also to entirely overcome, for example, a notion we have of development or also the notion we have nowadays of the economy or nature and kind of stressing that if we really want to, um, if we really want to find solutions to this multidimensional crises we're faced with and we also need multidimensional strategies that challenge the different power relations inherent to our mode of production and reproduction. Okay, so that was the first part. Um, I would say we make uh, take a like two minutes break maybe in order for you to digest it and um, then we will go on with part two which dives more concretely into feminist ecological economics. So let's go on with the second part um, of this lecture, which um, dives more specifically into one stream, which I haven't mentioned before, which is also a stream of feminist academic engagement with the environment. And it's more so one that is kind of specific to the summer school, actually linking um, feminist ecological uh, feminist economics to ecological economics. And I call the second part from the feminist critique of economics and growth to feminist ecological economics. So let's start by briefly um, taking one step back. I think you might have heard all this already um, throughout the week, but I just have one slide where I'm summarizing again, like what this feminist critique of economics and growth is kind of in a nutshell. Um, obviously it's much more than I can summarize in one slide, but I um, summarized some things that I consider very important for this interlink of feminist and ecological economics um, also. So the feminist critique of economics, one could say, um, emerged as a critique of, um, of economic thoughts that kind of emphasized that economic processes are in a way neutral and they don't have a gender. 
And what uh, feminist critique of economics, we could also call it feminist economics, um, did since the 1970s was saying, hey, that's not how this work. Economics is a discipline, so that's really androcentric. And if we now all close our eyes and if we imagine a homo economicus, then most of us would see a guy. And that's what um, the feminist critique of science um, kind of problematized from the very beginning that um, supposedly neutral objective economic processes also always produce and reproduce gender specific relations of power of domination and economics doesn't even realize it's doing that. And um, the feminist critique of economics criticizes, for example, GDP. It criticizes that GDP is used as a measure of economic activity, um, although it really structurally invisibilizes unpaid care and reproductive work. Like there's this famous textbook example that if someone um, married his house cleaner, then the GDP would shrink because the house cleaner who was paid for cleaning the house before would suddenly be married and then it would be unpaid work and then it wouldn't be included anymore. So that was one of the critiques going back very much to um, the early work of Marilyn Waring, If Women Counted from 1988. Um, feminist economics or the feminist critique of economics is also very much a critique of um, the narrow concept of work in economics, where work is most of the time equated in a way with wage work. We talk about work, we always think about wage work. And this um, really invisibilizes all other socially necessary work, which could be, for example, unpaid care work. It could also be community work. It could be subsistence work. It could be political activism, which is also work. So it kind of, in a way, invisibilizes if we're only talking about wage work. You know, if we say work and we only mean wage work, then we're invisibilizing all this other work that's um, socially necessary and that's upholding our societies. And the third, I already mentioned this a bit, is that, um, that feminist critique of economics is also, or has from the very beginning, problematized the homo economicus as being really androcentric, like this always rational, egoistic, and independent, independent from all kind of social relations, never needing care. Also in a life cycle perspective, obviously we're highly dependent, like we couldn't live without care in the beginning of our lives and the end of our lives and in many phases in between. So, that's something that the homo economicus doesn't talk about. It seems like it's really an andro and anthropocentric fiction of this always, um, of this needless um, person, which is always rational and independent. And the critique goes also back already to the early 1990s. For example, Julie Nelson and Marianne Ferber have written a very good book about it in 1993. So, one could maybe say that the feminist critique of economics and feminist economics is in a way the same, the same field of thought. But what I wanted to stress is um, that it's not the same for growth. Also, growth is obviously economic growth is measured as like you need GDP. So if you're criticizing GDP, um, you're kind of in a way also always um, criticizing economic growth, but many feminist economists aren't so outspoken about criticizing economic growth. Stephanie Seguino and the recent um, Rutledge Handbook of Feminist Economics writes that this is mostly because um, it's easier for in a growth scenario where the whole economy is kind of growing and people don't fight over resources and people don't fight over redistribution. It's um, supposedly easier to push for feminist policies than it is in a, for example, degrowth scenario. 
So I would say that if you really think, for example, so if you really take this GDP critique one step further, then it would also mean that um, we have to criticize economic growth. And there are some growth critical parts within feminist economics. And um, this growth critical parts are specifically um, also in this interface of um, feminist and ecological concern. So feminist ecological economics, I would say, is generally like a substream of both feminist and ecological economics. It is not only crit um, criticizing um, the economy, but also economic growth. So I'm introducing to you also feminist ecological economics. Um, one could say that feminist ecological economics emerged or grew out of two different streams of contributions, which was ecological economists who dealt with feminist issues, and on the other hand, feminist economists who dealt with ecological topics. So in a way, both ecological economics and feminist economics are heterodox economic schools of thought that emerged like in the late 1960s, early 1970s, kind of parallel in a way that both said, okay, environmental economics isn't really where we need to go and um, gender economics isn't really where we need to go. So both were kind of a critique to the economic mainstream and kind of both emerged in the early 1970s and then started to merge up from the 1990s onwards. And I think one of the most invaluable contributions to feminist ecological economics was really this 1997 special issue, which appeared in ecological economics. It was a special issue on um, women, ecology, and economics, which was edited by Ellie Perkins. You see her here in, in the top. And it had contributions, for example, by Maren Jochemsen and Ulrike Knobloch. I'm talking about um, their contribution in a bit. And also Sabine O'Hara and Hilke Pietile. So it really had those very foundational um, ideas behind feminist ecological economics are first spelled out in the special issue. So if you're interested in feminist ecological economics, really go back to this issue and it really gives you um, a lot of overview over the substream of thought. There has been a more recent special issue in feminist economics on um, ecology, sustainability, and care, which kind of used those, some insights back from 1997 and looks like how can we actually move toward an um, integrated perspective and the convergence between feminist and ecological economics. So I would say that there is like feminist ecological economics is also a bit diverse, but there is this common starting point. And this common starting point is to say that the formal growth driven money dominated economy, it's really one small part of the economy. Remember the iceberg from Maria Mies, it's only the tip of the iceberg that couldn't produce anything at all, like in the monetized economy without social reproduction and without natural processes. And um, what feminist ecological economics does, Sabine O'Hara, you see her here in the bottom says so, is um, that it turns things upside down in economics. And she says that what typically has been considered an externality now becomes the focus of analysis. So we all know it, for example, with regard to pollution, like in environmental economics or in mainstream economics, we would say, oh, yes, it's an externality and we have to internalize it via prices. So we all know this from our mainstream economics background. And what feminist ecological economics does is saying that's not an externality, that's a regularity. Every production process that we have in the monetized economy starts and ends with natural, starts with natural resources, ends in things. Or like with feminist um, issues, like it all, it couldn't work at all if it wasn't for unpaid care work of raising children, of providing like for the social reproduction, you need to go to work every day. So it's really of kind of 
it's really kind of radically challenging this notion of what is an externality and how can we internalize it and why don't we shift the focus and say that this externality is actually indispensable for economic processes. Um, so I brought one graph from um, a paper which was very influential for me, actually, like I built my whole PhD analysis started with this paper really um, by Marin Jochemsen and Ulrike Knobloch. Um, when I always thought, oh, we need to combine ecological and feminist economics and how do we do it? And then I found this paper from 1997 where say um, kind of built this very schematic model, which they called um, ICE or ECE model, where the I stands for industrial economic thought and action. The E stands for ecological processes and the C um, stands for caring activities. And um, what they do is kind of um, show, like they have so six arrows and they show the relation between those three, like in six um, arrows. So we have the first arrow, which would be from um, E to I. Um, so arrow from E to I, so from ecological processes to industrial economic thought and actions, they write, Ecological processes constitute the very foundation as well as the limitation of industrial economic thought and action. And if we look at the reverse direction, they say industrial economic thought, on the other hand, modify ecological processes with a strong tendency to destroy them. They do the same thing for the right side of, of this graphic. They say caring activities which in our society are mostly carried out by women, constitutes a social foundation that enable industrial economic thought and action. We look at the reverse um, relation again. So I say industrial economic thought and action devalues caring activities, relegates them to the realm of the economically non-important, thereby making them virtually invisible. So we see there is kind of this um, parallel devaluation and invisibilization of um, ecological processes and caring activities. And then they also talk about the relation between E and C. They say ecological processes are indispensable for caring activities and caring activities modify ecological processes with a strong tendency to sustain them. So in contrary to monetized um, or industrial economic thought and actions that has a tendency to destroy um, to destroy ecological processes. Caring activities are really there to kind of uphold them, to sustain them, to put them into the focus of our analysis. And then what interested me also in my PhD was kind of it was also like all those relations between I and E and C and I, but it was more something, um, it was more even on the things that you see here in red, namely the boundary. I was interested very much in um, the boundary between the monetized economy, Maria Mies would call it the tip of the iceberg on the one hand, and on the other hand, what I, in this very first paper um, in 2018, I called um, the Spirtestrunk maintenance economy, and later um, my PhD would call it economy of socio-ecological provisioning. So I was really, or I am actually really interested in um, this boundary between those two spheres. And um, this boundary have been, um, has been described by different conceptual dualisms by feminist ecological economists. So one would be productive, reproductive, one would be valuable, valueless, one is the focus of our economic analysis, the other one is the blind spot. So one is the one you count in GDP, the other is the unaccounted, and the so one is kind of the inside of our analysis in economics, and the other is the outside. So my interest um, in my PhD was really in looking how 
people or how economists deal with this, um, with this boundary where the monetized economy is not by poor chance on the top of the triangle, but it's on the top of the triangle because it kind of continuously invisibilizes both fears below. It devalues, socially devalues them and the sense of caring activities and it um, destroys them mostly in, in the case of ecological processes. And um, work that was really or is really important for um, thoughts about how to overcome this boundary. Okay, maybe one step back um, about the boundary. It is really that most feminist ecological economists would agree that we can only achieve environmental and gender justice if we transcend this boundary. So it could still be obviously like paid caring activities and unpaid caring activities. But the problem is really that only like the hierarchization inherent to this boundary that it's not only about money, like this boundary is not really about monetary valuation, but it's about equating monetary valuation with social recognition. And what we see is that very many times when we're trying to valorize care work, make it visible, for example, by shifting it to the top part of the triangle, we often see that it's valorized but not valued in a way that um, this boundary kind of reproduces um, gender injustices. So um, one contribution that has been very helpful also in feminist ecological economics is um, by Sabine Hofmeister, you see her in the top, and um, Adelheid Biesecker in the bottom. It's been their um, work on reproductivity. Um, they argue that there is this they call it the structure of separation, which is what I call the boundary, a structure of separation between the productive and the reproductive that has given rise to the present socio-ecological crisis situation. And um, they coined this term reproductivity as kind of a category of mediation between those two spheres, where reproductivity really Price overcoming the structural devaluation of non-monetized caring economy on the one hand and natural environment on the other, um, which kind of happens in this economic paradigm that only focuses on the tip of the iceberg. And this term reproductivity is really interested also in the solving um, this, um, separation structure and kind of reverting the hierarchical dominance of market activities over non-market caring and ecological provisioning. So if we really arrived at a reproductive economy, we could actually put different principles, for example, the principle um, of social provisioning that has been formulated by Marilyn Power in feminist economics at the core of what economics is. We could put um, the economy of socio-ecological provisioning at the core of what economics is. We could put the sustainability of life at the core of our economic analysis if we only manage to kind of bridge this deep separation structure between um, the productive and the reproductive. Um, so what I was interested in is strategies of how feminist economists deal with this boundary. And so this is very, because like we could do the same for ecological economists if we look at the ecological processes and how um, people deal, on, deal with it on the left side of the triangle in a way. Um, but I, like in my PhD, I was more, I did it at, um, at the chair for feminist economics. So I was more interested in this right side of how people deal with unpaid care work and how they try to kind of value it, grant value to unpaid care work. And generally, um, I like one of, um, one distinction that um, Masha Madurin and later Ulrike Knobloch have made when they ask the question, how to deal with unpaid care work? In German, it's a uh, four V's. It's not four V's in, in English. In English, we have avoiding, modifying, shifting, or redistributing. 
And um, it's just some very general strategies of how we can think about unpaid care work. So as a first one, avoiding unpaid care work, we could, for example, say, okay, let's avoid by unpaid care work by not cleaning the house every day, but for example, only once a week. And that does work with housework to a limited extent, but it does work. But it gets much harder, obviously, if we talk about um, direct caring activities that really depend on this direct um, relation, caring relationship between a caregiver and a care receiver. So avoiding care work is really possible only to a very limited extent. And it's a bit the same thing with modifying care work by means of technological innovation. Um, I mean, we all know that the washing machine was very important for feminist um, emancipation. However, if we talk about care robots, for example, then again, this question arises of what's a good life? And we see again that it works very well with household related um, care work, but it doesn't work so well with all this care work that involves direct caring relationships. Um, so redistribution of care work between genders, that's very unfortunate, hasn't worked as well as feminists have thought it would. Um, up until today, even when both, um, both genders work um, the same time in formal um, wage works and um, women still carry out the lion's share of, of unpaid care works. This has even intensified all over the world during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this redistribution, I think, is really where we want to go, but that's not what really happened so much over the last decades. But what happened was kind of um, the strategy of shifting unpaid care work, of trying to shift unpaid care work to the monetized economy. And it could be very different, obviously, if you shift it to the state or to the market or to an NPO, or if you just monetize it for the sake of including it into national accounting. So I don't want to um, put all those things into the same category, but the idea behind those um, the shifting um, strategies still remains the same, namely making the unpaid, making the hidden visible by means of giving it a monetary value where unpaid care works and becomes paid care work, where ecosystem functions become ecosystem services. So it's not always a commodification, it's sometimes just a monetization, but we also see that monetization sometimes is really just the first step to commodification. And what I would urge you to think about, and feminist ecological economists to think a lot about this dilemma of valuation, is really to think about how can we move beyond this, how can we maybe grand social recognition, which not necessarily has to tie directly to, um, to monetary, monetary values, because in the moment in which we only socially recognize what we monetize, then we're again reproducing this boundary and we're again um, devaluing everything that's below the boundary. Um, so, as I said, I'm um, personally very interested in strategies of dissolving the boundary. I was working a bit on, um, on caring commons and on how um, care work can be, for example, also um, happen in another sphere, which is not one of those traditional spheres of the care diamond, which would be um, state market, would be state market, not for profit or the household, but you could also um, say that there is another sphere, namely the sphere of the commons and of um, organizing unpaid work also collectively, um, which for example, there was a really good paper by Nina Banks from 2020, where she's arguing that basically for like feminist economists never see that the household isn't the only site of unpaid care production. And she's arguing very convincingly for the case of black women in the United States that collective unpaid care work has been there for ages. That's nothing we have to recreate out of the blue, but this economy and even more if you look to post-colonial contexts where a lot of care work is also shared collectively in countries which haven't had, for example, the historical privilege of a welfare state. 
where unpaid care work is sometimes not so individualized. So I think what we what we need is reimagining a way of, and it doesn't have to be carers commons. It can be very many different ways of dissolving this boundary. But I think um, I was interested in my PhD and also in feminist ecological economics with also discussions about the dilemma of valuation, which also draw from the dilemma of valuation in ecological economics and in feminist economics. I think we have to get better in reimagining how to um, how to socially revalue the economy of social and ecological provisioning without monetizing it or without necessarily monetizing it, finding different ways. And just to um, sum the second part up. Um, so what feminist eco um, ecological economics analysis do is um, that they show that what is counted in GDP, what is the focus of our analysis and economics is strongly subsidized um, by, and at the same time separated from this invisibilized and devalued economy of socio-ecological provisioning. Um, this boundary in our current economic system runs along the lines of monetary valuation of what is counted in GDP, what is monetized. And there are boundary struggles. I um, didn't talk about those before, but um, Nancy Fraser is uh, making this distinction of affirmative and transformative boundary struggles, where affirmative boundary struggles would be boundary struggles that just shift um, so, um, that just shifts a boundary, for example, by shifting it by if we shift unpaid caring activities to the paid care sectors and we're shifting the boundary downwards so the tip of the iceberg gets larger but we're just shifting it and transformative boundary struggles on the other hand would be boundary struggles that actually try to disrupt this boundary and eventually um could dissolve it so arguably um, strategies to value unpaid care work by monetizing it only tackles the surface rather than the steep underlying structure of separations that we have in economics that we saw now here in this section on feminist ecological economics, but it very much corresponds to what we've done in the first part, what we've seen in this whole debate on uh, materialist ecofeminism, and kind of the argument behind it is to say that. Um, just monetizing it, it's only an empirical matter, but it doesn't in a way dissolve the boundary and the structure of separation. And I think that for a feminist ecological macroeconomics, we need, we need to really find modes of um, valuation that really puts this socio-ecological provisioning approach or the sustainability of life at the center of what economics is. And I think that's a project on the making still. And now you're probably one of the first peoples who have enjoyed a whole week course on the convergence of feminist and ecological macroeconomics. And I put great hope in you that you will um, contribute to this endeavor. So that's it from my side. Thanks a lot. And I'm looking forward to discussing um, with you on Friday 16th.